Good evening, everyone. Time for episode 26 of the Drums of Doom, part two of the Dwaradim Staff Saga. And we're going to start the reading on page 322. It's October 20th, 2020. Carmen's Rangers are stuck in the catacombs of the Witch King, and it doesn't look good for them. <clears throat> Once you are all dead, Sheena said triumphantly, I will return to claim what is rightfully mine. She then spoke a single word, too softly for anyone else to hear, and disappeared. <clears throat> Fall back to the door, Carmen commanded. Dartin, run! He was farther from the door than any of them, naked and weaponless. Turning around, he saw the creature stepping out of its dark chamber, its hands extended, seeking his throat. He tried to summon the rune of banishment and other symbols that all evil beings feared, but his prayers were without power, his god still asleep. Backing away, he sought some place of refuge, but the monsters were closing their circle around him. They clearly held him in the greatest contempt. Perhaps some measure of his runes had been invoked, just not enough to stop them. The most powerful sorcerer that had ever existed, a being that had access to long-forgotten magic and the darkest enchantments, had created the mummies. Dartin was completely unprepared to meet horrors of such magnitude. Against one such being, he might stand a chance if his powers were available to him, but before eight creatures, his chances were minuscule. They faltered in their initial steps toward him, but their second and third grew ever stronger, and they drew toward his priest light like moths to a flame. Their eyes had, lo had locked all their anger upon him, their steps were heavy with contempt, their moans filled with ancient curses. Carmen's arrows thundered into them. The hero's swords crashed against their corpses, but it did not matter. The mummies were among the mightiest of death's warriors, and they swarmed over Dartin like lions to the kill. Surrounding him, the first mummy reached for his throat, and Dartin caught its wrists in his hands and struggled with all his might. Staring at the monster in utter defiance, he smiled and began to sing his death song. The mummy's supernatural strength was almost limitless, and for a few seconds, Dartin held against it. His valiant efforts could not last. Striking him from behind and beside, each blow broke his bones and smashed his organs. His strength failed, and the mummy's hands found his throat and squeezed the last of the light from his body. His eyes bulged, and then grew dark. His body was smashed, torn, and ruined. They defiled him, tearing off his arms, smashing his legs and his skull, and then hurled him to the rear of the chamber, where he would forever rest. No! Leander screamed. The blood rage took hold of him then and he laid into the mummies with the sword of the guardian of the east wind. He was berserk, desperate, and fearless. He cared nothing for his own safety, and his enchanted blade proved effective when wielded with such fury, hacking off the left leg of the monster nearest him. The mummy toppled. Far from finished, it crawled toward him. Reaching for his legs, it sought to bring him down and destroy him. Carmen's rangers fought as one now, exhausted, utterly without hope and filled with sorrow. If they remained in the room, then they would all surely suffer the same fate as Dartin. His remains crushed and strewn around the room. They knew that there was no help, no hope left for him. Never had they left anyone behind, but it was not merely their fate that mattered. The items that they carried could bring about the end of the world, and if they fell, the last hope of all that was good would end. Dartin would want them to save themselves, but there was only one way out, back the way they had come, back through the halls of the dead. Fall back, Carmen ordered. Leander, fall back. I'll hold them as long as I can, Kerr said. Get him out of here. Leander could hardly see for the tears that bled from his face. 
All that he could feel was the utter loss of his lifelong friend. Avenge him was all that he then knew. But something was pulling him back, away from his enemies. No, let me go, he pleaded. Save your anger for the hall, Tarek said firmly. Come back to us, Leander. We need you. The ranger's words crashed into him like a cold plunge into the sea in winter. Once again himself, he nodded to Tarek and joined them in their retreat, fighting as they ran. Forming a defensive circle beside the door that spelled either salvation or doom, they hurled vases and pots, treasure chests, and everything that they could reach into the path of the mummies. Karina guarded the right flank, while Kalor stood with Dao at the center. The elf raising his power, and Kalor readying the book of Modrul. Kerr drank a hero's potion, and Carmen plied her bow. Tarek wielded flame like a whirlwind, with Leander beside him. Karina screamed, The door is giving way! Odin. He awoke screaming. Sweat poured from his brow, and his body would not respond to his will. He felt like he had been sleeping for a hundred years, or at least a hundred Asgard years. Slowly, he rolled onto his side and sat up. Rubbing his eyes, he yawned and stretched. His wife was sitting by the window, knitting. "'You must have had a bad dream, my love,' Frigga said. "'It was the most terrible nightmare that I have had in centuries. "'Tell me about it.' "'Dartin Odinson, the last priest of our line, is dead. "'Perhaps you should go and get him. "'He has fallen in a place that I even I dare not tread. "'His spirit is trapped by Endemar Tabarun, the Lich King. "'Are there no others?' No mortal yet lives, Odin replied, who knows the powers of the runes. Then I shall pray for a miracle, Frigga said. All is lost. I fear that the time of the gods is coming to an end. If anyone can find a way, it is you, my love. Summon the Aesir, Odin commanded. The council of the gods convenes in two days' time. As you wish, my love, she answered, while her husband sat for some time with his head in his hands. <clears throat> the Hall Dao evoked his deadliest magic then, pouring forth a long, scorching wave of fire out of his hands. Several of the mummies were immolated, their rotten trappings burning away, their dried flesh roasting. They were staggered by the fire, but not finished, for they were, after all, beyond death driven by dark powers stoppable only by the holiest relics of goodness. Ancient swords of power could sting them, but the price of engaging them was too terrible to risk. One blow of their limbs was deadly, their strength invincible. Stand clear of the door, Carmen ordered. Let them come. The portal burst inward. Death's army rushed in, and such was the pressure of the mass that all the, all the corpses in the lead could well see their quarry. They were helpless to stand and fight against the driving tide behind them. The room filled. Mummies were now embattled by a sea of their brethren. In their rage, they hurled their skeletal brothers aside, striving in their malice to destroy the living. The ensuing chaos created the opening that Carmen had hoped for. Kalor, if you're going to do something, now would be a good time. He could not reply. So deep was he in the casting of Modrul's spell, the dragon's book hovering before him, magic coursing through his body. With his right hand he reached up, and with dragon's sorcery he pulled ice, sleet, and snow from the ethers and rained it down upon the dead. The spell was powerful, dangerously so. It filled the entire room, and he could not prevent the storm from falling upon them as well. We must flee, he cried, closing the book. He tucked it beneath the folds of his cloak and sought refuge. There was no clear line of battle, no obvious avenue of retreat. Surely they too would have been overwhelmed, if not for the rallying cry of their leader. To me, to me, she called, and to her side. The embattled battled, each individual spirit fighting as one to her voice alone. Her sword flashed repeatedly, the sword of the west wind. Guardian against evil, and fleshless arms fell, still grasping weapons of war, 
or cracked shields. Spinning a circle of destruction around her, her friends found a new refuge by her side, a place to stand firm and drive on. Her valiant effort won the door in the first few feet of the hall. Her companions were hot on her heels, snow-covered and bruised by hail, but alive. We must reach the main hall, Kerr said, before they bury us beneath their wretched bones. Press on, Carmen commanded, holding the rear while her companions forged ahead. Together then, Tarek said, and their blades fought in unison, driving back the tide of the dead into the room behind them. Kalor's spell continued to rain down on the ghastly mass within, and the deluge of ice and snow soon trapped their old bones. Odd it was that Dao then took the lead beside the stalwart dwarf. Fighting on to clear the way for their friends, the battle lust was upon them. They fought in a style of alliance between dwarf and elf that had not been seen since the dawning days of the world. Corin Koth smote in a wide arc, and when the heavy blade struck bone, the legions of the Lich King were shattered, and where Dao's sword struck, skulls sundered and rib cages smashed. In his fury, Dao remembered powers that had long been dormant within him, secrets that his father had whispered to him while he was still in the womb. Forgotten the mysteries that his people had been born to wield since the dawn of time. He had ascended in fire, as his father had said he would. He was a warrior mage, reborn. Out of fire we were born, and onto the earth we rose. First born of God's children, first to discover the magic of earth and fire, air and water. By tempest I invoke my power, by tempest I ascend. <clears throat> Dao raised his hand, and a billowing gust of wind rose up before him, sweeping away the skeleton warriors blocking the passage like leaves before the gale. Wasting neither a precious moment nor a miraculous opportunity, they ran on. Leander and Tarek were the last to leave. Looking into the room, they both hoped that somehow their friend would step out of the storm and shake the snow off his coat, as they had seen him do at least a hundred times before. Tears poured from their eyes as they realized that this time he would not. Peering through the hail and stinging mist, they saw only the terrifying orbs of the mummies, delayed, yes, but not beaten. Death's disciples still trudged unrelentingly toward them. We must flee, Tarek said, and when they could safely wait no more, they raced on. Eighty feet, and they had reached the main hall. Their friends were embattled from the north, from the west, and from the south struggling to hold the intersection of three great cryptways and the mummies to the east they would soon be surrounded tarek and leander prepared to defend their rear flank they could see the mummy king standing defiantly in the doorway the tempest behind him waning with one hand upon the door and the other daring them to meet their deaths he laughed his gurgling wail echoing down the hall forever would it haunt their dreams it looked for a moment as if he would stoop low and pass through the door with his brethren. But much to their surprise, the mummy king then slammed the door. Perhaps they had had enough of the living for one century, or more likely, they could not leave their cursed room. Behind them, the catacombs were filled with endless ranks of undead warriors, but more so it seemed along the north passage from whence they had come. Kerr, press on to the south, Carmen ordered. But Kerr's instincts as a soldier had already anticipated her decision. The well of grief within him had filled once again. This time, Dartin's blood was on his own hands. Fighting like a demon, he wielded his axe two-handed, his every blow crushing blow, bone, blasting his enemies away or cleaving them in two. Every foot of ground was sorely won, and none of them went uninjured. Dwarf and Elf fought on, now with their leader beside them and their friends holding back the following horde. Kerr and his axe were one. His weapon held many secrets, and at times the ranks of the dead appeared to him as an ancient army of elves, and to them he seemed like Baldric, firstborn of the dwarves. 
There were those among them whose spirits could still remember windows of the past, and these would sometimes forget their hatred and return to their catacomb resting places in order to dream of ancient memories of their former lives. The vast majority of the dead, however, were long past remembering. Their contempt was every bit the equal to their distance from life. The Lich King's legions rose and stood against them at every turn. The southwestern hall was now either their path to escape or the road to their doom. Dwarf, elf, and woman fought side by side, druid, ranger, and sword maiden holding back the horde rushing in behind them. Kalor ran between them, struggling to secure Modrul's book so that he could join in the fight. They fought, they ran, and they bled. Guardian blades and sword of flame, the columns of the dead began to crumble. Their bones littered the hall, most smashed to pieces, but dismembered limbs still sought to kill them, vacant eye sockets still yearning for their deaths. The bony remains soon became treacherous obstacles, as much a bane to them as it was to the undead. Unfortunately, the dead were endless and untiring. They neither gasped for breath nor felt the fatigue of war. Battling without fear or pain, they could only be stopped by their destruction. Dao and Kalo were beacons of light in the very home of darkness. His diamond glowed brilliantly, urging them ever southward, and the elf's dagger carried the light of the sun into battle. Carmen looked ever ahead toward hope, cutting down any creature of evil that drew too close. Her gentle heart attracted their enmity like flies to honey, and they vied to kill her in preference to all others. Her sword was a bane to evil, and such was its power that many of the skeletons that she struck were sent to oblivion were blasted to dust. The passage was a writhing mass of skeleton warriors, so thick that they resembled the scaly skin of a serpent in the moonlight. <clears throat> it seemed to her that all hope was lost. No matter how many they destroyed, there were a thousand more to replace them. It was then that she saw it. Beyond the sea of death, at the furthest reach of her enchanted vision, she spied a door. There, she said, pointing to the south, a door. Press on. It's our only chance. Kerr rallied ever harder to her call, as he had once done in service to the king, and he would gladly do to the end of days. He was Corin Koth, the embodiment of rage. His arms lashed out to an ancient rhythm bubbling up from deep within his very soul. His grief was a bottomless well. Invoking his god's name, he cried out, Clangetius! And it seemed that Baldric himself then fought before them, and there was no skeleton warrior that could stand against him. Step by step he took ground and gave none. If there were corpses beneath his feet, he stomped through them. If the dead tried to bring him down, he threw them off. His mind was lost. His inner beast had risen. He was the warrior of countless battles, each one lending to the fire of his soul. Some part of him knew that his friends fought beside him, but it was a small part. Destruction was his path, carnage his very soul. The distant draw door grew ever closer. The ranks of dead before them were thinning, but six greater guardians stood barring that portal. Six skeleton warriors with golden crowns and rich raiment. Their armor was ornate and silver, <clears throat> their swords long and two-handed. None shall pass, they moaned, when Kerr finally broke through the last column, and Carmen shattered the last enemy in her way. These six horrors remained. Clearly they were not as the others were. Some greater evil resided within them, a sinister presence, the likes of which none of them had before encountered. Four of them moved to the kill, while the other stood, two stood barring the door. A cackling voice then echoed down the hall. None of you will ever leave this place. Kill them. Kill them, my brothers. The voice in the darkness chilled them to the core, and yet there was one among them to whom those words meant nothing. His mind, at least the part that might have felt doom, was far away. Only the warrior remained. With hardly a thought, Kerr produced Prince Lauren's shield 
and rushed in to meet the nearest threat. The ancient prince of the dead actually paused for a moment to salute his valor, raising his sword before him, proffering its hilt to heaven and its blade toward hell. If Kerr had been in his right mind, he would have returned the salute, but his current mental state was a blast of furnace, blast furnace of chaos. Its great sword descended upon him with all the might of any knight living. Receiving the blow upon his shield, Kerr moved inside, slashing again and again. The skeleton warrior's armor proved resilient, its bones hardened by necromancy. Carmen dueled with two deathly knights beside him. Her sword's blade, once the brightest sheen of steel, had somehow turned blue, and in that hopeless hour, Kerr thought that he saw a halo of light above her head. <clears throat> but later, he would certainly believe that it was merely a dream brought on by the stress of battle. <clears throat> Moving like a whirlwind, she avoided their deadly blows long enough to decapitate the rightmost knight. Its skull rolled from its neck. Its crown clattered to the floor. Its nightmare hands released their grasp and its sword fell. With a savage kick, she sent his remains into its brethren behind it, and it fell in a heap of bones and shining metal. Ducking beneath the remaining knight's stroke, she dueled on. Perhaps it was the light that Dal carried, or simply the light of his life that the thing despised. Regardless, the fourth knight attacked him with terrible fury. Its sword clove his own in two with its first stroke, and with only a dagger in his hand, he could only retreat, but there was no room for that. Rolling hard to escape the knight's next cut, he came up fast near the tunnel wall. His wizard's intuition goaded him to prepare the small mace that Kalor had given him, but what could a small mallet do against such a thing as this? What indeed? For when he unhooked it from his girdle, it sprang to life, nearly quadrupling in size. Too large to wield one-handed, he left his dagger on the lip of an empty coffin and took up its handle. Just in time, he blocked the knight's next deadly attack. Driven backward into the wall, they wrestled. The knight was strong. Far stronger than Dao, and its sword blade pressed closer and closer to his throat. A few more seconds, and it would be over. The hall behind them, beyond them, was filling with the wretched dead. Tarek stood at the center, his sword of flame, a burning light blazing against the horde. Leander fought by his side. His sword, enchanted to battle dragons, was nevertheless a masterwork, and every, every bit the equal to destroying these undead. Karina held the right flank, and her sword sang a symphony of impenetrable death around herself. Her skill would never again be doubted. She knew that this was not the time to protect her husband's ego. A legion of skeleton warriors wielding scimitars and other old weapons with the skill of ancient memories proved no match for her. Her sword was always faster, striking like a viper, slashing like a wildcat, wielding a tapestry of ruin about herself like the Lyoselfa sword maidens of old. A sundered arm grasped Karina's ankle and she cut it free. A legless torso clawed its way toward her and she smashed it. Fighting together as one, they actually began to gain a few more feet of hall. Bones and still animate remains piled up all around them. They were holding, but for how long? The dead were without end, and they would eventually tire. Modrul's book refused to fit back into the straps of his pack. There was no time for it enemy anyway. Dao was in trouble. Drawing his dagger, Kayla drew back to throw, but there was a sudden upheaval from the floor beneath him. He was hurled backward and thrown down when a massive wall of ice rose up beneath his very feet. Filling the tunnel from floor to ceiling, it divided their strength in half. Kerr, Carmen, and Dow now faced five nights of death alone, and the rest of them would soon be crushed by the coming tide. Kalor, Tarek said, it's up to you to bring it down. There was a spell that might work, one of the few of the dragons that remained. Luckily, the book had fallen with him on his side of the wall. In haste, 
Beneath the diamond's light, he turned the pages in search of it. The horde seemed to sense that their victory was at hand, and they pushed forward en masse. Cutting them down by the tens was not enough. The pile of corpses and fighting skeletons was being driven hard against them. Quickly, Kayla, we can't hold them much longer. Finding the spell, he struggled to concentrate, his heart pounding beyond his control. His comrades fighting desperately all around him. Reciting Modrul's words, the book rose up before him, and he spoke with the voice of the dragon. Hurling his magical might against the ice wall, he contested the dire power of the knight's necromancy. One tiny gnome, testing his will against that of evil's princes. There was no doubt in his mind, for if there had been, then he surely would have failed. He believed in the dragon's power, and he had never seen it falter. The spells collided, and the ice wall was banished. The knight who had summoned the wall was thwarted, but not beaten. Raising its jewel-encrusted hand, it pointed at Kalor and invoked its most terrible power. Kalor looked to his friend's plight, but instead he met only the sinister gaze of the knight who had raised it. Its eyes, nightmare pits, orbs of utter darkness, drove into his very soul. In the process, the misery of his own existence was revealed. The mystery of its own existence was revealed. Anger, despair, and sadness so deep and so hopeless that desolation seemed like utopia pulled his pulled his psyche in. Lie down and die, it said to him. Expose your neck. Let the pain end. His body was no longer his to control. Modril's book fell to the floor, its pages still open. Falling to his knees, there was no hope. Sudden pain racked his body, the dire revenge of the undead sorcerer. Writhing in agony, he couldn't act save to scream. He couldn't move save to gasp. Suddenly hoisted, he was draped over something. Somehow, he knew that it was Tarek that carried him. Excruciating waves of pain racked him. He was blind to all save the horrifying images of the necromancer. His spirit fought to expel the demonic mind that possessed him, but its will was tempered by thousands of years of endless torment. There was no escape from the iron fortress of its mind. The mound of corpses slid forward, slowed by the heroes who opposed it, yet unstoppable. No longer dueling, their fight had become a wrestling match. Three heroes trying to buttress the dam, a wave of corpses propelled by the storm. <clears throat> what lay behind the door, none of them could know. Their last hope, surely, greater dooms more likely, but to warriors with no other hope, it was the summit. Kerr's mind was flooded with emotions not his own. The dead knight battled not only with its weapons, but perhaps more terribly still with its mind. All manner of frightful images, feelings, and fear, in its purest and most reasonless form, assailed him. Lesser men would have faltered. Some may have run away, run while others would have been unable to act at all. But Kerr was not like other men. The evil thing croaked with glee, certain of its own victory. Obviously, it knew nothing of dwarves, and considerably less about a keg porter's heart. Fear was a sol was soldier's blood, and Kerr had known horror on a hundred battlefields. It was one weakness that could not possess him. He should have stood, too paralyzed to move or run away screaming. The dead knight prepared to execute its next swing, but its prey kept coming. Corin Koth removed its left leg at the waist and its right above the knee. It tried to attack, but toppled. Kerr struck it until the invader's voice was gone. Another knight stood before the door, working its evil upon them. Kerr raised his shield and charged. Now, dwarf, it said, you will die. With the point of its sword and a simple wave of its hand, it erected yet another wall of ice. Kerr was hurled to the floor. Rising to his feet, he gathered himself to charge. Less than twenty feet of tunnel lay between him and the necromancer, barred in front by a reinforced drawer and behind by an ice wall two feet thick. Don't bother, little one, it taunted. It will all be over soon. It then evoked its last horrible power against him. 
Its hand once again reached up, as if to summon power from the floor beneath itself, clenched, and then suddenly opened, bony, clawed, wielding power and white as death. It was a small space, instantly made into a blast furnace by its evil sorcery. The dead knight needed no air to breathe. Its skeleton no longer had any flesh to consume, and the very nature of its existence made it immune to its own fires. One small dwarf had no such immunity, but he did possess a magical ring. Without its protection, he would have died on the spot. His lungs would have been scorched and his flesh melted from his bones. Instead, he was hurt, his exposed skin badly burned and his clothing put to flame. The pain of his wounds was so terrible that it drove his mind far beyond reason. His only thought was to end his torment, and he knew from whence it came. The necromancer could not believe that he still stood. He would have to end the dwarf's life by the sword. They dueled, neither having the chance for reinforcement or reprieve, axe and shield against necromancer's blade. Its ego was such that it had no fear of the dwarf, nor did it even consider the possibility of its own destruction. In life, it must never have encountered very many dwarves, and never on the field of battle. If it had, then it would perhaps have given pause before engaging in single combat with a grievously wounded and completely berserk one. Kerr's axe hewed on. If the creature's armor stopped one blow, he hit it over and over again until it shattered or fell apart, and then he hit it some more. The knight struck him on the head with the pommel of its great sword, kicked him in the groin with its steel-toed boot, and struck Prince Loren's shield so stoutly that Kerr's forearm was fractured beneath it. If Kerr, still, if Kerr had still been even slightly sane at that moment, then he would surely have accepted his own death. But he wasn't sane at all. The souls of a hundred dwarves possessed him, ancient heroes, dwarven kings, wielders of the axe who had fallen in battle with it still in their hands filled his body, propping him up and empowering him with the heart and soul of his people. One mighty blow of corn cost severed its leg at the knee and sent it toppling. The second cut removed its sword arm at the elbow. The necromancer tried to overpower him with its dark will, but was itself assailed by a hundred heroic minds. Kerr hewed on until the necromancer was a collapsed ruin, when its wretched spirit finally fled its broken shell. Its enchanted wall fell, and so too did the yet mortal dwarf. He tried to rise again in order to help them, but his body would no longer obey him. The last thing that he saw was common struggle before the darkness claimed him. And we'll find out what happens to Carmen next time when we begin at the bottom of page 335. I hope you enjoyed episode 26. Very exciting action. And very sad. We lost the heroic Dartin, son of Odin. All right. So here we are. At the end of our night, have a great night. And as always, remember to read Kerr's Rage, Part 1, the Dwarheim Staff Saga, and then the Drums of Doom, Part 2. Thank you, have a great night.